Chapter 5 Antipsychotic Agents Let's start with the receptor binding properties of atypical antipsychotics. The first is of course the dopamine receptors. There are 5, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Then comes the serotonin receptors. There are total 11 of them as shown here. Four muscarinic receptors, four alpha adrenergic receptors and finally one histaminic receptor. Antipsychotic drugs exhibit possibly the most complex pharmacological mechanisms of any drug class within the field of clinical psychopharmacology. Now let's discuss what makes a conventional antipsychotic conventional. These are sometimes also called as classical, typical or first generation antipsychotics. The first antipsychotic chlorpromazine was famously discovered by accident in the 1950s when it was used for its antihistaminic properties. It was serendipitously observed to have antipsychotic effects also. Chlorpromazine and other antipsychotic agents of the time were all found to cause neurolepsis, which was an extreme form of slowness or absence of motor movements as well as behavioral indifference in experimental animals. And thus these drugs were sometimes called neuroleptics. The human counterpart of neurolepsis is also characterized by psychomotor slowing, emotional quieting and affective indifference. D2 receptor antagonism makes an antipsychotic conventional. The key pharmacological property of all neuroleptics with antipsychotic property was their ability to block dopamine D2 receptors. It is responsible not only for the antipsychotic efficacy of these drugs but also for most of their undesirable side effects including neurolepsis. The therapeutic action is due to blockade of D2 receptors specifically in the mesolimbic dopamine pathway thus reducing the hyperactivity in this pathway that is postulated to cause the positive symptoms of psychosis. But this also simultaneously blocks the same number of D2 receptors throughout the brain including the prefrontal cortex of the mesocortical dopamine pathway and the pituitary gland of the tuberoinfundibular dopamine pathway this causes undesirable side effects which can be equated to high cost of doing business with conventional antipsychotics for most conventional antipsychotics the degree of d2 receptor binding in the mesolimbic pathway needed for antipsychotic effects is close to 80% while d2 receptor occupancy greater than 80% in the dorsal striatum is associated with extra pyramidal side effects and in the pituitary is associated with hyperprolactinemia Now let's discuss neurolepsis in a bit more detail. The D2 receptors in the mesolimbic dopamine system also forms the normal reward system of the brain and the nucleus accumbens is widely considered to be the pleasure center of the brain. It may be the final common pathway of all reward and reinforcement including not only normal reward but also the artificial reward of substance abuse. Thus, if D2 receptors in the mesolimbic system are blocked This may not only reduce positive symptoms of schizophrenia but also block reward mechanisms leaving patient apathetic and hedonic and lacking motivation interest and joy from social interactions thus may contribute to worsening of the negative symptoms of schiz in addition antipsychotics also block d2 receptors in the mesocortical da pathway where da may already be deficient in schiz and may cause or worsen negative and cognitive symptoms An adverse behavioral state can be produced by conventional antipsychotics and is sometimes called the neuroleptic induced deficit syndrome as it looks much like negative symptoms produced by schiz itself. Extra pyramidal symptoms and tardive dyskinesia. When a substantial number of D2 receptors are blocked in the nigrostriatal DA pathway, this will produce various disorders of movement that can appear very much like those in Parkinson's disease. therefore sometimes called drug induced parkinsonism since the nigrostriatal pathway is part of the extra pyramidal nervous system these motor side effects are also called extra pyramidal symptoms or eps now if these d2 receptors in the nigrostriatal da pathway are blocked chronically they can produce a hyperkinetic movement disorder known as tardive dyskinesia this movement disorder causes facial and tongue movements such as constant chewing tongue protrusions and facial grimacing and also limb movements that can be quick jerky and choreiform the d2 receptors in the nigrostriatal pathway are hypothesized to become super sensitive or to be upgraded that is increased in numbers 
perhaps in a futile attempt to overcome drug induced blockade of d2 receptors about 5% of patients maintained on conventional antipsychotics will develop td every year that is about 25% of patient every 5 years the risk of developing td in elderly subjects may be as high as 25% within the first year of exposure to conventional antipsychotics interestingly if d2 receptor blockade is removed early enough td may be reversible this reversal is due to a resetting of the d2 receptors by an appropriate decrease in number or sensitivity but after long term treatment the d2 receptor apparently cannot or do not reset however risk diminishes considerably after 15 years of treatment a way to predict those who may develop tardive dyskinesia is patients who develop eps early in treatment and may be twice as likely in addition specific genotypes of dopamine receptors may be important genetic risk factors a rare but potentially fatal complication called the neuroleptic malignant syndrome associated with extreme muscular rigidity high fever coma and even death possibly related in part to d2 receptor blockade in the nigro striatal pathway can also occur prolactin elevation as discussed previously the d2 receptors in the tubero infundibular da pathway are also blocked by conventional antipsychotics and this may cause plasma prolactin concentration to rise a condition that is called hyperprolactinemia and this is associated with conditions such as galactosuria amenorrhea sexual dysfunction and weight gain in addition hyperprolactinemia may lead to more rapid demineralization of bones especially in postmenopausal women who are not taking estrogen replacement therapy the therapeutic dilemma of blocking d2 dopamine receptors in all dopamine pathways as it has become apparent blocking dopamine receptors in other pathways than in mesolimbic may be harmful the ideal yet hypothetical case here would be to decrease dopamine in the mesolimbic dopamine pathway to treat positive psychotic symptoms theoretically mediated by hyperactivity of mesolimbic dopamine neurons yet to increase dopamine in the mesocortical dopamine pathway to treat negative and cognitive symptoms by leaving the dopaminergic tone unchanged in both the nigrostriatal and the tubero infundibular dopamine pathways to avoid side effects muscarinic cholinergic blocking properties of conventional antipsychotics As shown in the very first slide, the APs also block M1 cholinergic receptors and cause undesirable side effects such as dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation, and cognitive blunting. Interestingly, those conventional antipsychotics that cause more EPs are the agents that have only weak anticholinergic properties, while that cause few EPs are the agents that have stronger anticholinergic properties. This is due to the fact that dopamine and acetylcholine have reciprocal relationship with each other in the nigrostriatal pathway. And these dopamine neurons in the nigrostriatal dopamine pathway make postsynaptic connections with the cholinergic neurons. Thus dopamine normally inhibits acetylcholine release from postsynaptic nigrostriatal cholinergic neurons thus suppressing acetylcholine activity there. Now if dopamine can no longer suppress acetylcholine release because dopamine receptors are being blocked then acetylcholine becomes overly active drugs with anticholinergic actions will diminish the excess acetylcholine activity caused by removal of dopamine inhibition when dopamine receptors are blocked therefore once again the conventional antipsychotics with potent anticholinergic properties have lower eps then conventional antipsychotics with weak anticholinergic properties furthermore the effects of d2 blockade in the nigrostriatal system can be mitigated by co-administering an agent with anticholinergic properties now let's discuss some other pharmacological properties of conventional antipsychotics the undesirable blockade of h1 receptors causes weight gain and drowsiness while the blockade of alpha 1 adrenergic receptors causes cardiovascular side effects such as orthostatic hypotension and drowsiness haloperidol has relatively little anticholinergic or antihistaminic binding activity whereas the classical conventional antipsychotic chlorpromazine has potent anticholinergic and antihistaminic binding activity a somewhat old fashioned way to subclassify these conventional antipsychotics is low potency versus high potency 
the low potency agents have greater anticholinergic antihistaminic and alpha 1 antagonistic properties than the high potency ones coming on to atypical antipsychotics these have the much desired clinical profile of equal positive symptom antipsychotic actions but low extrapyramidal symptoms and less hyperprolactinemia since almost all the agents with this atypical profile come after the introduction of clozapine sometimes atypical antipsychotics are also called second generation or serotonin dopamine antagonists as there is simultaneous serotonin 5-HT2A receptor antagonism that accompanies D2 antagonism serotonin synthesis and termination of action also known as 5-hydroxytryptamine and abbreviated as 5-HT its synthesis begins as the amino acid tryptophan which is transported into the brain from plasma to serve as the 5-HT precursor Firstly, tryptophan hydroxylase converts tryptophan into 5-hydroxytryptophan and then aromatic amino acid decarboxylase converts 5-HTP into 5-HT as shown in this slide. After synthesis, 5-HT is taken up into synaptic vesicles by VMAT2. 5-HT action is terminated when it is enzymatically destroyed by monoamine oxidase and converted into inactive metabolites. The 5-HT neuron also has presynaptic transport pump for serotonin called CERT that is unique to 5-HT and that terminates serotonin's action by pumping it out of synapse and back into presynaptic nerve terminal. Now let's discuss 5-HT2A receptors. All 5-HT2A receptors are postsynaptic and are located in many brain regions. On cortical pyramidal neurons, they are excitatory and thus can enhance downstream glutamate release. And as glutamate regulates downstream dopamine release, so stimulating or blocking 5-HT2A receptors can therefore also regulate downstream dopamine release. These 5-HT2A receptors act as brakes on dopamine release in the striatum. 5-HT2A stimulation of cortical pyramidal neurons by serotonin hypothetically blocks downstream dopamine release in the striatum. It does this by a stimulation of glutamate release in the brainstem that triggers release of inhibitory GABA and thus release of dopamine from the neurons in the striatum is inhibited. 5-HT2A antagonism cuts the brake cables. 5-HT2A antagonism interferes with serotonin applying its braking action on dopamine release, thus stimulates downstream dopamine release in the striatum by reducing glutamate release in the brainstem, which in turn fails to trigger the release of inhibitory GABA at dopamine neurons and release of dopamine downstream in the striatum mitigates EPS. Interestingly, 5-HT2A receptors in other brain areas also act as break on dopamine release in the striatum. Now, serotonin neurons whose cell bodies are in the midbrain raphe may innovate nigrostriatal dopamine neurons both at the level of dopamine neuron cell bodies in the substantia nigra and at the dopamine neuron exon terminals in striatum. This innovation may be either via direct connection between the serotonin neurons and the dopamine neurons or via an indirect connection with a GABA interneuron. The 5-HT2A receptor stimulation by serotonin at either end of substantia nigra neurons hypothetically blocks dopamine release in the striatum. On the other hand, the 5-HT2A receptor antagonism by an atypical antipsychotic at these same sites hypothetically stimulates the downstream dopamine release in the striatum. Such release of dopamine in the striatum should mitigate EPS which is why antipsychotics with 5-HT2A antagonistic properties are called atypical. Thus, 5-HT2A receptor antagonism theoretically makes an antipsychotic atypical, that is, it has low EPS. The result of 5-HT2A receptor blockade is that it increases the dopamine release which competes with D2 receptor antagonists in the striatum and reduces the D2 receptor binding there below 80% to more like 60%, enough to eliminate extrapyramidal symptoms. Now let's discuss one more property of atypical antipsychotics that is low hyperprolactinemia. As previously stated, serotonin and dopamine have reciprocal roles in regulation of prolactin secretion from the pituitary lactotroph cells. That is, dopamine inhibits prolactin release whereas serotonin promotes prolactin release via stimulating 5-HT2A receptors. With atypical antipsychotics, there is simultaneous inhibition of 5-HT2A receptors, so serotonin can no longer stimulate prolactin release. This mitigates hyperprolactinemia of D2 receptor blockade. 
now let's discuss comparable antipsychotic actions of atypical antipsychotics interestingly 5-HT2A actions seem to be very different in different parts of the brain as previously stated in the nigrostriatal and the tuberoinfundibular dopamine pathways there is sufficient dopamine release by atypical antipsychotics to reverse in part the unwanted actions of EPS and hyperprolactinemia and this does not appear to occur in the mesolimbic dopamine pathway presumably due to regional differences in the way in which 5-HT2A receptors can or cannot exert control over dopamine release Simultaneous blockade of D2 receptors and the 5-HT2A receptors that can fortuitously have net blockade of different amounts of D2 receptors in different areas of the same brain at the same time with the same drug. The making of a therapeutic window. Atypical antipsychotics have an affinity for blocking 5-HT2A receptors that is equal to or greater than their affinity for blocking D2 receptors. Amount of D2 antagonism in the striatum is lowered at the same dose where the drug has antipsychotic actions. Interestingly, this creates a window between the dose that exerts antipsychotic actions and the dose that causes EPS or elevation of prolactin levels. Therefore, while D2 receptors are assumed to be blocked by 80% in the limbic areas to cause antipsychotic actions, the D2 receptors in both the striatum and the pituitary are assumed to be blocked by only approximately 60% below the threshold of side effects. And thus, the drug is only atypical in the dosing window created by the fact that atypical antipsychotics almost always have higher affinity for 5-HT2A receptors than they do for D2 receptors. Now, atypical antipsychotics can be categorized in many ways. They can be organized as either peens or dones, or as two pips and a rib. The peens bind more potently to the 5-HT2A receptor than they do to D2 receptors. Examples being clozapine, olanzapine, quetiapine, and esenapine. The dones either has a similar receptor profile as the peens, or show similar potency at both receptors. The examples being Resperidone, Paliperidone, etc. Eripiprazole and Keriprazine, on the other hand, both bind more potently to the D2 receptors than to 5-HT2A. And Brexpiprazole has similar potency at both receptors. 5-HT1A partial agonism can also make an antipsychotic atypical. Postsynaptic 5-HT1A receptors in prefrontal cortex are accelerators for dopamine release in striatum. As we know, if 5-HT2A stimulation is the break stopping downstream dopamine release, 5-HT2A antagonism cuts the break cable, enhancing dopamine release. And the true accelerator for downstream dopamine release in the striatum is postsynaptic 5-HT1A receptor on pyramidal neurons in the cortex. And this is done by reducing glutamate release in the brainstem, which in turn fails to trigger the release of inhibitory GABA at dopamine neurons there which finally causes dopamine release in the striatum and mitigates EPS. Presynaptic 5-HT1A receptors in the RAFI are also accelerators for dopamine release in the striatum. As we know, the 5-HT1A receptors can be presynaptic on the dendrites and cell bodies of serotonin neurons in the midbrain RAFI. These autoreceptors cause a slowing of neuronal impulse flow through the serotonin neurons and a reduction of serotonin release from its exon terminal. The down-regulation and desensitization of these presynaptic 5-HT1A somatodendritic autoreceptors are thought to be critical to the antidepressant actions of the drugs that block serotonin reuptake. When serotonin occupies a presynaptic 5-HT1A somatodendritic autoreceptor, it turns off serotonin neuron. As a consequence of this, serotonin is not released onto postsynaptic 5-HT2A receptors on nigrostriatal neurons activation of which would ordinarily inhibit dopamine release in the striatum. This allows the nigrostriatal dopamine neurons to be active and thus to release dopamine in the striatum. Pre and postsynaptic 5-HT1A receptors work together to enhance dopamine release in the striatum and when both are stimulated by certain atypical antipsychotics, this theoretically mitigates EPS. Some atypical antipsychotics have potent 5-HT1A partial agonist properties. In particular, the four mentioned two PIPs, namely eripiprazole and brexpiprazole, and the RIP, that is cariprazine. These all have 5-HT1A partial agonist actions not only more potent than their 5-HT2A antagonist actions, but comparable to their D2 antagonist actions.
Clinically relevant 5-HT1A partial agonist actions are also present in a few pins, especially clozapine and cutepine, and some of the dones, especially lurosidone, iloperidone, and ziprasidone. So theoretically, the most dopamine release in striatum and thus fewer EPS may occur when you take your foot off the brake and also step on the accelerator. Therefore, if blocking 5-HT2 receptors is like cutting the brake cables and if stimulating 5-HT1 receptors is like stepping on the accelerator, this could account for why both of these actions that release dopamine from the striatum might be additive and thus explaining why atypical antipsychotics have a reduced incidence of EPS. In addition, the atypical antipsychotics with 5-HT1A partial agonist actions that are proven antidepressants such as cutepine and eripeprazole may be working in part through this mechanism. Now the mechanism of how a 5-HT1 partial agonist exerts its possible antidepressant efficacy is unknown, but could be linked to release of dopamine and norepinephrine in prefrontal cortex or the potentiation of serotonin levels. 5-HT1 BD receptors 5-HT is detected in the synapse by presynaptic 5-HT receptors on exon terminals. It occurs via this 5-HT1BD receptor, which is also called terminal autoreceptors. And as expected, the 5-HT occupancy of this receptor causes a blockade of 5-HT release. Now drugs that block this autoreceptor can promote 5-HT release and this could hypothetically result in antidepressant action. Example being the experimental antidepressant vertioxetine. And among the atypical antipsychotics, only iloperidone, ziprosidone, and esenapine have 1BD binding more potent or comparable to D2 binding. And the low potency one includes olanzapine, cutiapine, and eripeprazole. Coming on to 5-HT2C receptors. These are also postsynaptic and regulate both dopamine and norepinephrine release. Stimulation of these suppresses dopamine release, curiously, more from the mesolimbic than from the nigrostriatal pathways, yielding an excellent preclinical profile, namely an antipsychotic without EPS. An example of this is the new antipsychotic webcaserine, which has entered clinical trials for the treatment of skis. Interestingly, stimulating 2C receptors is also an experimental approach to the treatment of obesity. 2C selective agonist lorcaserine is now approved for the treatment of obesity. Blocking these 2C receptors stimulate dopamine and norepinephrine release in prefrontal cortex and thus also has a procognitive action. Several antidepressants are 2C antagonists, ranging from certain tricyclic antidepressants to metrozapine to agomelatin. Some atypical antipsychotics also have potent 2C antagonistic properties, especially the peens, such as cutiapine and olanzapine. Olanzapine is often combined with fluoxetine to boost olanzapine's antidepressant actions. In treatment resistant and bipolar depression, as phloxetine has potent 2C antagonistic properties. Similarly, cutapine has synergism between its norepinephrine reuptake blocking properties and its 2C antagonistic properties. Also, potent 2C antagonistic actions suggest theoretical antidepressant effects of esenapine. And there is only weak 2C binding properties for most of the other atypical antipsychotics. Coming on to 5-HT3 receptors. 5-HT3 receptors are postsynaptic and regulate inhibitory GABA interneurons and thus regulate the release of all the major neurotransmitters ranging from serotonin to acetylcholine to norepinephrine, dopamine and histamine. 5-HT3 receptors are also involved in centrally mediated vomiting and possibly also in nausea. And blocking these 5-HT3 receptors in the chemoreceptor trigger zone in the brainstem is an established therapeutic approach to mitigating the nausea and vomiting caused by cancer chemotherapy and the peripheral 5-HT3 receptors in the gut regulate bowel motility. Blocking 5-HT3 receptors on GABA interneurons increases the release of said neurotransmitters in the cortex and is thus a novel approach to an antidepressant and to a procognitive agent. Mitrazepine and the experimental antidepressant roteoxetin are both potent 5-HT3 antagonists in combination with inhibition of reuptake of serotonin, norepinephrine and or dopamine. And among the atypical antipsychotics, only clozapine has 5-HT3 binding potency comparable to its D2 binding potency. 5-HT6 receptors. These are postsynaptic and may be key regulators of the release of acetylcholine and cognitive processes. Talking these receptors improve learning and memory. Therefore, 5-HT6 antagonists have been proposed as novel pro-cognitive agents for the cognitive symptoms of skis.
Some atypical antipsychotics are potent 5-HT6 antagonists, examples being clozapine, olanzapine, and esonapine. The other atypical antipsychotics have only moderate or weak binding properties to 5-HT6 receptors, examples being cutiapine, ziprosidone, iloperidol, eripiprazole, and brexpiprazole. 5-HT7 receptors. These are also postsynaptic and are important regulators of serotonin release. When blocked, serotonin release is disinhibited. Novel 5-HT7 selective antagonists are thought to be regulators of circadian rhythm, sleep, and mood. Several proven antidepressants have at least moderate affinity for these 5-HT7 receptors. Examples being amoxapine, desipramine, imipramine, meansorine, floxetine, and voteoxetine. Similarly, several peens and dones are also potent 5-HT7 antagonists. Examples being clozapine, cutiapine, esenapine, resperidone, paliperidone, and lurosidone. A plausible but unproven conjecture is that 5-HT7 antagonism contributes to the known antidepressant actions of cutiapine and eripiprazole, especially in combination with SSRIs and SNRIs. D2 partial agonism also makes an antipsychotic atypical. Some atypical antipsychotics stabilizes dopamine neurotransmission in a state between silent antagonism and full agonist action by acting as a partial agonist at D2 receptors. Many degrees of partial agonism are possible between these two extremes. As stated many times in previous chapters, partial agonists are sometimes called Goldilocks drugs if they get the balance just right and cause signal transduction from the receptor to be intermediate between full output and no output. Interestingly, a very small amount of signal transduction through D2 receptors in the striatum by a partial agonist is needed to avoid extrapyramidal side effects. Thus, a very slight degree of partial agonist property, sometimes called the intrinsic activity, can have a very different set of clinical consequences. Just slightly, too close to a pure antagonist, that is, too far to the left, and it is just a conventional antipsychotic with EPS and echinacea unless it has other 5-HT2A or 1A properties to compensate for this. And on the other end, just slightly too far to the right and it is an atypical antipsychotic without EPS or akathisia, but one that is too activating, capable of worsening positive symptoms of skis and also causing intolerable nausea and vomiting. And thus, the elusive Goldilocks solution of a drug is a tolerable high-dose antipsychotic without EPS and a tolerable low-dose antidepressant. Sulpride and amisulpride are just barely off the antagonistic part of the spectrum without sufficient 5-HT2A or 1A action and have low but not zero EPS with robust antipsychotic activities at high doses plus anecdotal but not well-tested antidepressant and negative symptoms clinical action at low doses. The first dart thrown at the partial agonist spectrum was OPC4392. It landed too close to the agonist part of the curve improved negative symptoms of skis, but it also activated positive symptoms, so was never marketed. Another dart closer to the antagonist part of the spectrum landed in the form of eripiprazole. It ameliorated positive symptoms without activating negative symptoms at higher antipsychotic doses, while proving to be an antidepressant at lower doses. Still has some akathisia and some thought, this was because it might be a bit too close to the antagonist end of the spectrum. Another dart called now I might be pronouncing this wrong, Bifebrunox was aimed further up the spectrum, landing as more of an agonist than eripiprazole but less of an agonist than OPC, but turned out to be too much of an agonist causing nausea and vomiting from its dopamine agonist and 5-HT1A partial agonist actions. Two more agents with antagonistic actions greater than eripiprazole are in late stage clinical testing, namely a second PIP, brexpiprazole and the RIP, keripruzine. Antidepressant actions in bipolar and unipolar depression. Atypical antipsychotics also have antidepressant actions due to serotonin and or norepinephrine reuptake inhibition. Although only cutepine has potency greater than its D2 binding, but ziprazidone and zotepine also have weak binding at these sites. Coming on to alpha 2 antagonism, the proven antidepressant mirtrazepine is best known for this, but several atypical antipsychotics also have this action. With variable degree of potency, including all the pins, higher potency especially for cutiapine and clozapine, and the dones, in which the higher potency is especially for risperidone, as well as eripiprazole. Antiemetic actions Atypical antipsychotics have greater efficacy or at least greater documentation of antiemetic action. 
D2 antagonism or partial agonism combined with 5-HT2A antagonism is the mechanism for this. Anxiolytic actions Some studies suggest efficacy of various atypical antipsychotics for generalized anxiety disorder and to augment other agents for other anxiety disorders, but perhaps more controversial is their use in PTSD. It is possible that the antihistaminic and the anticholinergic sedative properties of some of these agents are calming in some patients and is responsible for this action. Therefore, let us discuss the sedative hypnotic actions of these agents. Sedation can be both good and bad. It is a desired therapeutic effect, especially early in the treatment during hospitalization when the patients are aggressive, agitated and need sleep induction. But in the long term, sedation is generally a side effect to be avoided because diminished arousal and somnolence can lead to cognitive impairment. Three particular receptors are responsible for causing sedation and these are M1 muscarinic receptors, H1 histaminic and alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. Interestingly, blocking central alpha-1 receptors is associated with sedation, while blocking the peripheral ones is associated with orthostatic hypotension. Central dopamine, acetylcholine, histamine and norepinephrine are all involved in arousal pathways. Blocking one or more of these can lead to sedation as well as cognitive problems. Atypical antipsychotics clozapine, quetiapine, olanzapine and iloperidone are all more potent H1 antagonists than D2 antagonists. All other antipsychotics have moderate potency only, except lorazidone, which has essentially no binding to H1 receptors. And as for the anticholinergic actions, only the peens, clozapine, quetiapine, and olanzapine have high potency for muscarinic receptors. And there is essentially no muscarinic receptor binding for the other atypical antipsychotics. Coming on to the alpha 1 adrenergic antagonism. All atypical antipsychotics have at least a moderate binding potency to these receptors. But the most potent related to the D2 binding are clozapine, quetiapine, risperidone and iloperidone. In conclusion, the peens are more sedating than the dones. And the presence of antihistaminic and antimuscarinic binding has implications for how fast one can taper or switch these agents. Coming on to the cardiometabolic actions. Atypical antipsychotics that have high metabolic risks are clozapine and olanzapine, while the ones associated with moderate metabolic risk are risperidone, paliperidone, quetiapine, and iloperidone. The ones associated with low risk are ziprazidone, eripiprazole, luracidone, iloperidone, and esenapine, while the metabolic risk of grexpiprazole and keripirazine are unknown. The metabolic highway begins with increased appetite and weight gain and progresses slowly to obesity, insulin resistance and dyslipidemia with increased fasting triglyceride levels. Ultimately, hyperinsulinemia leads to beta cell failure which causes pre-diabetes and then finally diabetes. Once diabetes is established, risk of cardiovascular events is further increased. So what can be done to counter this? First, increased appetite can lead to elevated BMI and ultimately obesity. Therefore, weight and body mass index should be monitored. Second, insulin resistance can be detected by measuring fasting plasma triglyceride levels. Finally, atypical antipsychotics are known to cause sudden onset diabetic ketoacidosis, also known as hyperglycemic and hyperosmolar syndrome by unknown mechanism, possibly by the blockade of M3 cholinergic receptors. This can be detected by informing patient of the symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis and by measuring fasting glucose levels. Thus, the monitoring toolkit should include items for tracking four major parameters weight, body mass index, fasting triglycerides, fasting glucose, and blood pressure. As stated before, the receptors associated with increased weight are H1 and 5-HT2C. Thus, the cardiometabolic complications associated with agents that have both potent antihistaminic properties as well as 5-HT2C antagonistic properties and the examples being clozapine, olanzapine, quetiapine and the antidepressant mitrazapine. There is an acute receptor mediated action of these drugs on insulin regulation. In this hypothesized mechanism, the antipsychotics bind to a so-called receptor X at adipose tissue, liver and skeletal muscles to cause insulin resistance. Now let's discuss individual antipsychotics. Clozapine It is a well-known 5-HT2A and D2 antagonist, also known as serotonin dopamine antagonist, and is considered to be the prototype of atypical antipsychotics. 
although antipsychotics are generally dosed so that about 60% of d2 receptors are occupied this may be lower for clozapine for unknown reasons clozapine causes very few if any extra pyramidal effects not causes any tardive dyskinesia and does not elevate prolactin and is recognized as the gold standard for efficacy in schiz patients treated with clozapine may occasionally experience an awakening characterized by return to a near normal level of cognitive interpersonal and vocational functioning and not just significant improvement in positive symptoms of psychosis this is unfortunately very rare it is also the only antipsychotic that has been documented to reduce the risk of suicide in schiz and clozapine may actually reduce tardive dyskinesia severity in some patients with this problem but then clozapine is also the antipsychotic associated with the greatest risk of developing a life threatening and occasionally fatal complication called agranulocytosis in about 0.5 to 2% of patients and thus blood monitoring is needed for as long as clozapine is continued it also has an increased risk of seizures especially in high doses can be very sedating can cause excessive salivation and has an increased risk of myocarditis and is also associated with the greatest degree of weight gain and possibly the greatest cardiometabolic risk among all the antipsychotics thus clozapine may have the greatest efficacy but also has the most side effects among the atypical antipsychotics interestingly the cause of agranulocytosis myocarditis and seizures are entirely unknown while weight gain may be associated with the blockade of both h1 and 5ht2c receptors sedation is probably linked to clozapine's potent antagonism of m1 h1 and alpha 1 adrenergic receptors profound muscarinic blockade can also cause excessive salivation especially at higher doses as well as severe constipation even leading to bowel obstruction from paralytic ileus olanzapine it has a chemical structure related to clozapine and is also an antagonist at both 5ht2a and d2 receptors it is considered atypical in that it generally lacks eps not only at moderate doses but even at higher antipsychotic doses it is usually less sedating than clozapine but can be somewhat sedating in some patients as it does have antagonistic properties at m1 h1 and alpha 1 receptors it does not raise prolactin levels even with long term treatment but is constantly associated with weight gain perhaps because of its 5ht2c antagonistic properties and similar to clozapine it also has one of the greatest cardiometabolic risks as it robustly increases fasting triglyceride levels and insulin resistance by unknown mechanisms used in most patients in clinical practice in slightly higher doses that is more than 15 mg per day these higher doses might be associated not only with greater efficacy that is improvement in clinical symptoms but also with greater effectiveness in clinical outcome based upon the balance of safety and efficacy it improves mood not only in schiz but also in bipolar disorders and in treatment resistant depression particularly when combined with antidepressants such as fluoxetine perhaps because of the 5ht2c antagonistic properties with the weaker 5ht7 and alpha 2 antagonistic properties of olanzapine olanzapine is available as an oral disintegrating tablet as an acute intramuscular injection and as a long acting 4 week intramuscular depo quetiapine also has its chemical structure related to clozapine and is antagonist at both 5ht2a and d2 receptors Interestingly, the net pharmacological action of quetiapine is actually due to the combined actions of quetiapine itself and its active metabolite, norquetiapine. Coming back to quetiapine, it is actually a very interesting agent since it acts like a different drug depending upon the dose and the formulation. Quetiapine comes in an immediate release as well as an extended release formulation. The IR formulation as expected has a relatively rapid onset and short duration of action. is more sedating as its peak delivery is shortly after taking it and is mostly due to its antihistaminic properties thus making it an ideal hypnotic at 300 mg per day probably the lowest effective antipsychotic dose the ir formulation rapidly occupies more than 60% of d2 receptors sufficient for antipsychotic action but then quickly falls below 60% of d2 receptor occupancy thus requiring dosing more than once a day or a very high dose to sustain adequate d2 receptor occupancy throughout the day On the other hand the XR formulation at the same dose slowly hits its peak yet has a rapid enough onset of 60% d2 occupancy to be effective without the same amount of sedation and its duration of action above the 60% threshold is for several hours even at the maximum dose of 800 mg as used in treatment resistant cases 
the ir formulation still occupies d2 receptors only for about 12 hours above the required 60% threshold risking breakthrough symptoms at the end of the day on the other hand xr maintains full effective d2 occupancy until the next day 24 hours later but then xr formulation is not ideal as an hypnotic because the peak is much delayed and a good deal of residual drug is still present when the patient wakes up increasing the chances of causing hangover effects norquetiapine it has some unique pharmacological properties that is not only net inhibition but also 5ht7 2c and alpha 2 antagonism as well as 5ht1a partial agonist actions now let's discuss quetiapine as a different drug at different doses the antipsychotic quetiapine is an 800 papa bear ideally in the xr formulation the antidepressant quetiapine is a 300 mg mama bear also ideally in the xr formulation and the sedative hypnotic quetiapine is a 50 mg baby bear ideally in the ir formulation the baby bear in ir formulation blocks almost all h1 receptors within minutes of oral administration and then rapidly declines in terms of h1 occupancy diminishing the chances of a hangover but the baby bear doses are not approved as hypnotics plus this can be an expensive option with metabolic risks so it is not considered a first line option for sleep and with xr formulation this peak is not reached until it is time to wake up now the mama bear is a surprise bear in many ways anecdotally observed to have antidepressant effects in bipolar as well as unipolar depressed patients in the 300 mg range this can be contributed to its active metabolite norquetiapine which has norepinephrine reuptake blocking and 5ht2c antagonistic properties much greater than the parent quetiapine itself two mechanisms can individually increase the release of both dopamine and norepinephrine and together appear to have a synergistic action at doses below those that cause 60% of d2 occupancy in addition to this quetiapine also has 5ht1a partial agonist as well as 5ht1bd7 and alpha 2 antagonistic properties also theoretically linked to antidepressant actions as exa formulation has a consistent day long receptor occupancy it is preferred formulation for the treatment of depression quetiapine is approved both for bipolar depression and as an augmenting agent to ssris and snris in unipolar depression that fails to respond sufficiently to monotherapy simultaneously treating symptoms of insomnia and anxiety by antihistaminic actions finally coming to the 800 mg papa bear it completely saturates both h1 and 5ht2a receptors continuously in both cases but has a more consistent occupancy above 60% of d2 receptors with xr formulation no matter what dose or formulation quetiapine is very atypical in that it causes virtually no eps at any dose nor prolactin elevations the quetiapine tends to be the preferred atypical antipsychotic for patients with parkinson's disease who require treatment for psychosis as is clozapine but can cause weight gain particularly when given in moderate to high doses as it blocks h1 receptors and increases fasting triglyceride levels as well as can cause insulin resistance asenapine it is a near atypical antipsychotic and the chemical structure is related to the antidepressant mirtazapine and thus share several of its pharmacological properties especially 5ht2a 2c h1 and alpha 1 antagonism of course suggesting that asenapine would be an antipsychotic with antidepressant actions but only its antipsychotic and antimanic actions have been proven thus far it is unusual in that it is given as a sublingual formulation because the active drug is very poorly bioavailable if it's swallowed due to extensive first pass metabolism and this limits the size of dose and the extent of absorption at high doses therefore it is generally given twice a day despite a long half life can be used as a rapidly acting oral antipsychotic as a top up in some disturbed patients without restoring to injectables one side effect of sublingual administration in some patients is oral hypoesthesia can be sedating especially upon first dosing but does not have a high propensity either for eps or for weight gain or dyslipidemia its antagonistic actions at 5ht2c 7 1bd and alpha 2 receptors and partial agonist actions at 5ht1a receptors as studied previously serotonin inputs to 5ht2c receptors on gaba interneurons both in the brain stem and in the prefrontal cortex normally causes gaba release onto norepinephrine and dopamine neurons which in turn inhibits the release of norepinephrine and dopamine out of these neurons in prefrontal cortex when these 2c receptors are blocked norepinephrine and dopamine release is disinhibited in prefrontal cortex which theoretically has antidepressant effects
antidepressants such as agomelatin and mitrazapine and others that have 5-HT2C antagonistic properties that are predicted to raise norepinephrine, serotonin and dopamine levels via alpha-2 antagonism also potentiate the elevation of serotonin levels in the presence of certain reuptake blockade by SSRIs or SNRIs by 5-HT1BD as well as 5-HT7 antagonism. These properties suggest utility for negative symptoms of skills. Zotapine is only available in Japan and Europe. Some amount of EPS and prolactin elevation has been observed. Along with increased risk of seizures, especially at high doses, as well as weight gain and sedation. It can also cause insulin resistance, dyslipidemia and diabetes. And has dose-dependent QTC prolongation. When given, it is generally administered 3 times a day. It is a 5-HT2C7 and alpha-2 antagonist and a weak partial agonist at 5-HT1A receptors as well as a weak inhibitor of norepinephrine reuptake. Coming on to the dones. Risperidone. It has atypical antipsychotic properties, especially at lower doses, but can become more conventional at higher doses in that EPS can occur. Can raise prolactin levels even at low doses and weight gain can be a particular problem in children. It is approved for treatment of irritability associated with autistics, including symptoms of aggression towards other, deliberate self-injury and tantrums, as well as for mood swings in bipolar disorder. Lower doses are often used as off-label for treatment of agitation and psychosis associated with dementia, but then risk-benefit ratio must be considered. Available in long-term depot lasting two weeks, as well as orally disintegrating tablets and liquid formulation. Paliperidone It is the active metabolite of risperidone and is thus also known as 9-hydroxyrisperidone. But there are some major differences between the two, such as paliperidone is not hepatically metabolized. Its elimination is based upon urinary excretion and thus has few pharmacokinetic drug interactions. Oral formulation is provided in sustained release and thus can be administered once a day. It is more tolerable with less sedation, orthostasis and EPS. But is similar to the parent in causing weight gain, insulin resistance, diabetes and elevation of plasma prolactin. Interestingly, 1 mg of paliperidone is not equal to 1 mg of risperidone. 6 mg of paliperidone is a better starting dose and is generally well tolerated and can be increased to 9 mg on the 8th day and even to 12 mg on the 15th. For best efficacy, a depot palmitate formulation of paliperidone for long-term administration every 4 weeks is also available and also lacks the potential problems of severe sedation that is common with olanzapine depot. Ziprasidone It has a novel pharmacological profile that is little or no propensity for weight gain despite its moderate 5-HT2C and H1 antagonistic activities as well as little association with dyslipidemia, elevation of fasting triglycerides and insulin resistance. Interestingly, when patients who have developed weight gain and dyslipidemia from high-risk antipsychotics are switched to ziprasidone, there can be weight loss and lowering of fasting triglycerides. And it is given twice a day with food. Because failure to give with a 500 calorie meal can result in lowering oral absorption by half and thus inconsistent efficacy. Does not cause dose-dependent QT prolongation and has very few drug interactions. It also has an intramuscular dosage formulation for rapid use in urgent circumstances. Might also have antidepressant actions including antagonism at 5-HT2C, 7, 1-BD and alpha-2 receptors. 5-HT1A partial agonism and weak reuptake blockade of norepinephrine and serotonin. Iloperidone. It's also a newer atypical antipsychotic and its most distinguishing clinical properties being very low levels of EPS, a low level of dyslipidemia and moderate level of weight gain. But is associated with potent alpha-1 antagonism and thus is associated with orthostatic hypotension and sedation. Even though it has 18 to 33 hour half-life and theoretically supports once daily dosing but generally is dosed twice a day and titrated over several days to avoid both orthostasis and sedation and is used as a switch agent in non-urgent cases. It is unknown why iloperidone, like cutepine and clozapine, has such low incidence of EPS. It may be in part due to the fact that all three of these agents have high affinity for alpha-1 receptors as well as 5-HT2A receptors. As EPS has been linked to high affinity for 5-HT2A, 1A and M1 receptors. Central alpha-1 receptors has been linked to therapeutic effects such as improvement in nightmares, as with prazosine in PTSD, 
Iloperidone is moderate alpha 2, 5-HT1 BD and 7 antagonist and 5-HT1 A partial agonist suggesting antidepressant effects. Exhibits dose dependence QTC prolongation, moderate weight gain but low incidence of dyslipidemia. Luracidone It is also a newer atypical antipsychotic with 5-HT2A and D2 antagonistic properties. Has high affinity for both 5-HT7 and 2A receptors, moderate affinity for 5-HT1A and alpha-2 receptors, yet minimal affinity for H1 and M1 receptors. Generally is without sedation and along with ziprasidone and eripiprazole has little or no weight gain or dyslipidemia and virtually no QTC prolongation. Is switched to lorosidone. From previous agent associated with weight gain and dyslipidemia, such side effects may even reverse. A starting dose of 40 mg is an effective antipsychotic dose. Although studies suggest that for maximum long-term efficacy, doses up to 160 mg per day may be useful in some patients. Might cause moderate EPS, but this can be reduced if given at night. As with ziprasidon, absorption of lorosidon is much greater when it is given with 500 calories of food. Its robust antidepressant efficacy is explained by the receptor binding profile of 5-HT7, 1A and alpha-2 and thus is effective in bipolar depression as well as mixed depression. As previously studied, 5-HT7 receptors are located both on GABA neurons in the raphe as well as in prefrontal cortex. And stimulation of these receptors by serotonin is thought to release GABA and thus serve as a negative feedback loop and turns off further serotonin release. On the other hand, blocking this 5-HT7 receptors causes decreased excitation, that is inhibition of the GABA interneurons, and thus leads to increased release of serotonin from these raphe neurons wherever they project, theoretically causing an antidepressant action. Coming on to two pips and a rip, eripiprazole. It is a D2 receptor partial agonist, and this is the major differentiating pharmacological feature. This results in reduced EPS and hyperprolactinemia. It also has 5-HT1A partial agonist action that is more potent than its 5-HT2A antagonistic action but less potent than its D2 binding affinity. It is effective in treatment schiz and mania and is approved for use in various child and adolescent groups including schizophrenia for age 13 and older, acute mania and mixed mania for age 10 and older and autism related irritability in children aged 6 to 17. It lacks sedation as there is no M1 and H1 antagonistic properties and like ziprasidone and lurosidone, there is little or no propensity for weight gain, dyslipidemia, elevation of fasting triglycerides or insulin resistance. If switched to eripiprazole, there can be weight loss and lowering of fasting triglyceride levels. Maybe it lacks the ability to bind to that X receptor mentioned previously. It is approved as an augmenting agent to SSRIs and SNRIs in treatment resistant major depressive disorders as well as bipolar depression. Explanation for this is its potent 5-HT1A antagonistic activity as well as 5-HT7 partial agonist activity. Partial agonist actions at both D2 and D3 receptors mean it acts more as an agonist than as an antagonist at D2 receptors at low doses, thus slightly boosting rather than blocking the hypothetically deficient dopamine neurotransmission. Too hot, that is, too much of an agonist and thus can be activating in some patients causing mild agitation as well as causing nausea and occasional vomiting. Or too cold, meaning that it is too much of an antagonist, causing akathisia in some patients, which can often be decreased by dose reduction or administering anticholinergics or benzodiazepines. An intramuscular dosage for short-term use is available, as are orally disintegrating tablets as well as liquid formulations. Coming on to two pips and a rip, eripiprazole. It is a D2 receptor partial agonist and this is the major differentiating pharmacological feature. This results in reduced EPS and hyperprolactinemia. It also has 5-HT1A partial agonist action that is more potent than its 5-HT2A antagonistic action but less potent than its D2 binding affinity. It is effective in treatment schiz and mania and is approved for use in various child and adolescent groups including schizophrenia for age 13 and older, acute mania and mixed mania for age 10 and older and autism related irritability in children aged 6 to 17. It lacks sedation as there is no M1 and H1 antagonistic properties and like ziprasidone and lurosidone there is little or no propensity for weight gain, dyslipidemia, elevation of fasting triglycerides or insulin resistance. If switched to eripiprazole there can be weight loss and lowering of fasting triglyceride levels. Maybe it lacks the ability to bind to that X receptor mentioned previously.
it is approved as an augmenting agent to SSRIs and SNRIs in treatment resistant major depressive disorders as well as bipolar depression. Explanation for this is its potent 5-HT1A antagonistic activity as well as 5-HT7 partial agonist activity. Partial agonist actions at both D2 and D3 receptors mean it acts more as an agonist than as an antagonist at D2 receptors at low doses, thus slightly boosting rather than blocking the hypothetically deficient dopamine neurotransmission. Too hot, that is, too much of an agonist and thus can be activating in some patients, causing mild agitation as well as causing nausea and occasional vomiting. Or too cold, meaning that it is too much of an antagonist, causing ecthesia in some patients, which can often be decreased by dose reduction or administering anticholinergics or benzodiazepines. An intramuscular dosage for short-term use is available, as are orally disintegrating tablets as well as liquid formulations. Cariprozine. It is another D2 partial agonist in late stages of clinical testing, but is more of an antagonist at D2 receptors than eripiprazole, but less of an agonist than the related partial agonist bifepronox, an agent that did not receive FDA approval, as it had clinical effects consistent with being too much of an agonist, that is, too activating, causing slow dose titration and nausea and vomiting, and also had less efficacy compared to other antipsychotics. And this cariprazine may be preferred at higher doses for mania and schizophrenia to emphasize its antagonistic actions, and at lower doses for depression to emphasize its agonist actions and potentially its uniquely D3 preferring properties. Have two very long acting active metabolites with the novel and interesting potential for development as weekly, bi weekly, or even monthly oral depot. Shows a very low incidence of EPS in clinical testings, perhaps because of its potent 5-HT1A partial agonist actions and lesser 5-HT2A antagonism. At higher doses, cariprozine could potentially block 5-HT7 and 2C receptors for hypothetically antidepressant actions. At very low doses has unique D3 preferring over D2 affinity, with both actions being partial agonist, and this may be linked to cognition, mood, emotions, and reward. The others Sulpride it is an earlier compound and thus causes EPS and prolactin elevation at usual antipsychotic doses, may be activating in some and have efficacy for negative symptoms for schizophrenia and for depression at low doses, where it is D3 preferring. It functions as a partial agonist at lower doses and as a more conventional D2 antagonist at higher antipsychotic doses. Emisulpuride It is a partial agonist very close to the full antagonist end of D2 spectrum has no appreciable affinity for 5-HT2A or 1A receptors to explain its low propensity for EPS and its observation of improvement of negative symptoms. Is an antagonist at 5-HT7 and causes weight gain, dyslipidemia, diabetes, dose-dependent QTC prolongation and prolactin elevation. It is likely closer to a silent antagonist and may only function as a partial agonist at low doses and a more conventional D2 antagonist at high doses. Certain doll. A newer atypical antipsychotic with 5-HT2A and D2 receptor antagonistic properties was withdrawn for further testing for its cardiac safety and QTC prolongation potential and then reintroduced in some countries as second-line agent with close monitoring of cardiac status. Perospiron It's an atypical antipsychotic with 5-HT2A and D2 antagonistic properties and is available only in Japan. 5-HT1A partial agonist actions contributes to its efficacy. But side effects such as weight gain, dyslipidemia, insulin resistance and diabetes has not been well investigated. And it is generally administered 3 times a day. Coming on to the art of switching antipsychotics. Patient can develop agitation, activation, insomnia, rebound psychosis and withdrawal effects especially anticholinergic rebound if done too quickly or without finesse. Best results are usually obtained by cross titration over several days or weeks. This is not only acceptable but in fact desirable polypharmacy. If the second agent is not satisfactory, it is generally preferable to try a third rather than to use two agents together indefinitely in what can be unacceptable polypharmacy. Switching between two agents that are similar is generally easier, faster and has fewer complications, namely pin to a pin or don to a don in as little as a week's time. The binding characteristics as we have studied of pins and dones are different. Peens in general have more anticholinergic and antihistaminic actions, thus are more sedating than the dones. When switching from peen to a done, it is generally a good idea to stop the peen slowly over at least two weeks, allowing the patient to readapt to withdrawal of blocking of cholinergic 
histaminic and alpha receptors thus making the transition more tolerable without anticholinergic rebound agitation or insomnia clozapine should always be stopped very slowly over 4 weeks or more if possible and from a don't to a peen it is generally best to titrate up the peen over 2 weeks or more to become tolerant to the sedating effects of most peens although the don't can usually be stopped as quickly as over 1 week switching to and from aripiprazole is a special case in part because it has different pharmacological properties it has higher potency for d2 receptors than any other drug meaning that its administration causes essentially immediate withdrawal of the first drug from d2 receptors and these principles are also applicable to the new four mentioned pip and arip namely brexpiprazole and carprazine switching to aripiprazole from apine start at a middle dose build up rapidly over 3 to 7 days while taking 2 weeks to taper the pain it essentially replaces the first drug at the d2 receptors immediately the slower down titration of pain allows the readaptation of cholinergic and histaminergic receptors to minimize withdrawal and also allows slower offset of any sedation actions from a done start at a middle dose build it up rapidly over 3 to 7 days but it is possible to taper the done over one week switching from aripiprazole to a pain consider immediately stopping the aripiprazole which has not only high potency for d2 receptors but a very long half life that is more than 2 days start at a middle dose for the pain and build up over 2 weeks to a done consider immediately stopping the aripiprazole and starting a middle dose of the done build up over 1 week treatment resistance and violence what if clozapine does not work or you cannot prescribe it for medical reasons or if the patient refuses to take it commonly used strategies for treatment resistance and violence are high dosing use of two concomitant antipsychotics and augmentation of antipsychotic with mood stabilizers violence that is linked to psychotic behavior despite standard antipsychotic dosing may be caused by inadequate occupancy of d2 receptors due to pharmacokinetic failure that is drug is not adequately absorbed or it is excessively metabolized Diagnosis of this is possible by measuring therapeutic drug concentrations. The treatment solution is to raise the dose above the standard dose in order to compensate for the low amount of drug getting to D2 receptors. This chart shows various brain areas related to psychotic aggression and its clinical remedy. Psychotic aggression in positive symptoms is related to mesolimbic area and the remedy is to increase the striatal D2 occupancy more than 60%. Psychotic aggression in negative symptoms is related to mesocortical and prefrontal cortex area and the remedy is the same as with positive symptoms. Psychotic aggression in affective disorders is related to VMPFC and the remedy is mood stabilizers. Impulsive psychotic aggression is related to OFC and amygdala and the remedy is similar as the positive symptoms and negative symptoms. Cognitive or instrumental aggression and violent psychopathy is related to DLPFC. and can only be improved by behavioral treatments seclusion or incarceration pharmacological failure is to have adequate clinical response despite attaining 60% or more striatal d2 occupancy one cause can be that the patient has an affective disturbance that requires augmentation with mood stabilizers especially with divalprox or lamotrigine but even with lithium or an antidepressant another approach is to wait for their clinical effects to kick in and use time as a drug and treat for many weeks hoping to get a good outcome but as can be expected there is no way to predict this another approach suggests that some patient require much more than 60% d2 occupancy to have an adequate treatment response and a way to target that is to use standard doses of two antipsychotics at the same time but then patients can have intolerable side effects most commonly sedation eps weight gain but occasionally paralytic ileus especially with very high doses of pain such as clozapine ketiapine and olanzapine as well as cognitive dysfunctions very high dose monotherapy or antipsychotic polypharmacy should be used sparingly and only in selected cases such as treatment resistance and violence another group of patients with instrumental aggression related to sociopathy and antisocial personality disorders no amount of d2 antagonism is likely to help and as previously stated might need behavioral treatments seclusion and incarceration psychotherapy and schizophrenia This includes adding cognitive behavioral psychotherapy to antipsychotics in order to strengthen the patient's capacity for normal thinking using mental exercises and self-observation to better cope with residual positive symptoms and to lead an independent life.
patients who are already stabilized on antipsychotics are often capable of being taught to critically analyze hallucinations and examine any underlying beliefs in their hallucinations or delusions. Family support is essential for encouraging patients to comply with their antipsychotic treatment and to recognize early signs of relapse and side effects and to reduce their own emotional reactions to the patient and this devastating illness so that their own emotions do not trigger more acting out by the patient. Community treatment programs are highly beneficial, helping patients with vocational rehabilitation, finding paid work and thus enhancing self-esteem. Motivational therapies have been shown to be effective in schizophrenia. Cognitive remediation is a novel psychotherapy utilizing computerized therapies designed to improve neurocognition in areas such as attention, working memory, cognitive flexibility, planning, and executive capacity. Future Treatments of Schizophrenia Glutamate Linked Mechanisms The first of these are known as ampakines. As previously studied, AMPA receptors regulate ion flow and neuronal depolarization that can lead to NMDA receptor activation. The modulators of AMPA receptors as well as PAMs are called ampakines and these are thought to enhance cognition. Coming on to m -gluars, these regulate neurotransmission at glutamate synapses as well as presynaptic m -gluars act as autoreceptors to prevent glutamate release. An agent acting at this site as a presynaptic m 2 3 agonist could potentially prevent excessive glutamate release from glutamate neurons which occur as the downstream consequence of NMDA hypoactivity and thereby improve the symptoms of schizophrenia. Coming on to glycine agonists, these include the naturally occurring amino acids glycine and D-serine as well as an analogue of D-serine called D-cycloserine which is also active at the glycine co-agonist site of NMDA receptors and can reduce negative and or cognitive symptoms. Stimulating the glycine site will boost NMDA receptor activity in a manner that is sufficient to overcome its hypothetical hyperfunction that thereby reduces negative and cognitive symptoms but possibly even positive symptoms. Glutamate Signaling Abnormality in Schizophrenia Glutamate is released from intracortical pyramidal neurons, however, NMDA receptor that it would normally bind to is hyperfunctional, preventing glutamate from exerting its effect at that receptor. This prevents GABA release from the interneurons, thus it cannot bind to alpha-2 GABA receptors on the exon of another glutamate neuron. When GABA does not bind to the alpha-2 GABA receptors of this pyramidal neuron, it is no longer inhibited. Instead, it is overactive, releasing excessive glutamate into the cortex. The hypothetical mechanism of action of m 2 3 agonists in schizophrenia. m 2 3 are presynaptic autoreceptors that act to prevent glutamate release, and this m 2 3 agonists may be able to reduce excessive downstream glutamate. Even in the presence of reduced GABA inhibition of glutaminergic neurons due to hypothetical NMDA receptor activation on GABAergic interneurons. Hypothetical Mechanism of Action of Selective Glycine Reuptake Inhibitors in Schizophrenia As we know, glycine is needed in addition of glutamate in order to activate NMDA receptors. By blocking its reuptake, more glycine will be available in the synapse, which could theoretically enhance their function. Hyperfunctional NMDA Receptors and Positive Symptoms of Schizophrenia If NMDA receptors on the cortical GABA interneurons are hyperactive, then the cortical brainstem glutamate pathway to the VTA will be overactivated leading to excessive release of glutamate in the VTA. This will lead to excessive stimulation of mesolimbic dopamine pathway and thus excessive dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens, which is related to the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Hypothetical Mechanism of Action of m 2 3 agonists in Schizophrenia GLIT-1 inhibitors, sometimes also called as selective glycine reuptake inhibitors or SGRIs. Glycine transporters on glial cells terminate the action of glycine. GLIT-1 increases the synaptic availability of glycine and thus enhances NMDA neurotransmission. Several GLIT-1 inhibitors are now in clinical testing, including the natural agent and methylglycine, also known as sarcosin. Sarcosin has been shown to improve negative, cognitive and depressive symptoms, including symptoms such as elogia and blunted effect in schizophrenia. Betopertin has also reported proof of concept for reducing both positive and negative symptoms in schiz. Treatments targeting cognitive symptoms of schiz Cognitive symptoms are extremely important in determining the long-term outcomes in this illness. Thus targeting them with novel therapeutics remain an area of active investigation. Presymptomatic and prodromal treatment of schiz 
The current concepts about the natural history of schizophrenia is that this illness progresses from a state of high risk without symptoms to prodrome in teens with cognitive and negative but not psychotic symptoms to ultimately first episode schizophrenia in 20s with psychotic symptom. This is often a chaotic stage in the illness with a progressive downhill course and might have multiple remissions and relapses but never a complete return to previous functioning. Emerging concept is that treatments that reduce symptoms could also be disease modifying and given to high risk individuals who are either presymptomatic or in a state with only mild prodromal symptoms could prevent or delay the progression of schizophrenia. Possibly by preventing the plastic changes in brain circuits that fully establish or worsen psychiatric disorders. Pilot results from early intervention studies in first episode cases already suggest that treatment with atypical antipsychotics as soon as possible after the onset of first psychotic symptoms can improve outcomes. Even though early results with atypical antipsychotics are not definitive, they suggest that treating prodromal symptoms with antipsychotics, antidepressants or anxiolytics may delay onset of schizophrenia. The validation of diagnostic criteria for early onset prodromal and ultra high risk schizophrenia could help determine not only who should be tested with novel potential therapeutic interventions but also who should avoid high risk behaviors such as use of marijuana and other drugs as well as sleep deprivation and high stress activities.